Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. We pray that you will use your word in our hearts and our lives this morning. Open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of your law. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. There it is. It is on. Okay. I can smell the hand sanitizer. <laughs> some of you, some of you, I go back and shake your hands, and you just make a beeline back for the hand. I do wash my hands, all right? So just, but I understand. All right. Well, uh, talking about uh, what I just mentioned, we, we live in a sinful and fallen world, and I think we see evidence of that uh, more and more every day, and especially when you, when you turn on the news, right? You turn on the news and... And uh, it's just amazing over the last few weeks just how the fact that our world is a sinful and fallen place, just the evidence of that that has come to the surface in the national and world headlines. Uh, for instance, in the last couple weeks in South Carolina, a young man walked into, a, into a, a church and murdered nine people because he didn't like the color of their skin. He said he was trying to incite a race war. In Tunisia, a gunman last week murdered 37 people on the beach in one attack. Uh, and yet our president says that mass shootings only happen here in the United States for some reason. Islamic terrorists attacked an American-owned glass factory in southern France over the week, um, leaving a severed head of one of their victims on top of a fence post outside the factory. Uh, the, in Kuwait, an Islamic terror attack blew up a Shiite mosque and killed many victims there. Most of these things have been the result of the call from the leader of ISIS to take the, the Muslim month of Ramadan and, and uh, do as much damage to unbelievers and to what they call uh, fake Muslims, the Shiite Muslims. Uh, they, they're calling on the month of Ramadan to become a month of just terror all over the world. Um, in, here in the United States, sin has reared its ugly head in a Supreme, Supreme Court decision. I don't believe that necessarily that the Supreme Court ought to legislate morality, but it ought not to legislate immorality either. Uh, and so we've, we've seen, you just turn on the news, you look at the, you look at the, the headlines and you can tell that we're in a fallen world. And, and when you think about sin, uh, it's always been a problem in our world, in our country. And, 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 but it seems like it's getting worse, doesn't it, as the, as the world turns and the days go by. So I wonder, what is the worst sin of all? If you could classify sins, which one is the worst out of all of them? And are we guilty of it? Uh, there's a sin in our country that is worse than all of the sins that I've just discussed. It's worse than, than all sins committed. And it's now present in our country, and even in many churches, it's always been there. This sin was present at the time that Jesus walked the earth. And uh, it's, it's not a new sin, so it's not something that uh, things are getting worse, and now it's appeared. It's been here all along, as Christ traveled around Galilee preaching and teaching and performing amazing miracles, things this world had never seen before and has not seen since, he, Jesus often met with opposition. There were people who would eventually capture him and try him and kill him. There were people who tried to entrap him in his words. There were people who openly criticized Jesus. In fact, when John the Baptist came on the scene, he was fasting and living a very austere life. And, and those people said, he does that because he has a demon. They criticized John the Baptist for fasting. When Jesus came on the scene, he didn't fast. And so they said, look at Jesus. He's a glutton. He's a drunk. He's a friend of the wrong crowd. Um, but the worst sin was not committed by Jesus' murderers or by his critics, necessarily. Jesus spent most of his ministry in the northern region of Palestine called Galilee. Um, early in his ministry, Jesus moved his headquarters, or his, his home base, so you, if you would, uh, to uh, a place called Capernaum. And he lived there and, and, and kind of based all his movements in, out of the, in his ministry out of there, out of Capernaum. Most of the miracles that you read about when you go through the Gospels were performed 
in Capernaum and all the areas surrounding that, Bethsaida, Chorazin, and, and different uh, cities and in, in, in suburbs all around Capernaum in that northern Galilee area. Um, and, and there's even miracles, as the Gospel of John says, if they could have been recorded in books, the world could not contain the books to that, that talk about Jesus' miracles and works. All, most of that took place close to or in Capernaum. Um, because of this scenario, the people of Capernaum, of, of, of Bethsaida and Chorazin, they had in themselves the opportunity to commit the most wicked, the greatest sin ever imaginable. The worst of all sins, if you will. So this morning I'm going to show you from Scripture, I'm going to show you what the worst sin is that can be committed. The worst one that you can commit. When I tell you what it is, you're going to want to disagree with me. All right. When I read this passage of Scripture, I disagreed with it. Uh, and, and I said this can't be right, but it's in the Bible. And it's the words of Christ. And so you're going to be tempted to disagree with me. You might come up with a, lot, a nice long list of sins that you think will be worse than this one. You might think, well, murder, that's pretty bad. Adultery, fornication, uh, homosexuality, terrorism, atheism, unbelief. You can come up with a lot of things that are, I mean, high on the list. But I'm going to show you what Jesus said and uh, God helping me, by God's grace, prove it to you from the Scripture. And the proof is found here in Matthew chapter 11. And we're going to look at verses 20 through 24. Matthew chapter 11 is our text, verses 20 through 24. And in this text, we, we will uh, see what Christ tells us about the worst sin, what it is. And if you're like me, you might be tempted to disagree, but Jesus proves it. So let's see here. Matthew chapter, chapter 11 Verse 20, and he began to upbraid the cities. Upbraid just means to rebuke. He began to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Did you see it? Did you see what the worst of all sins is? It's right here. Jesus says in verse 20, they saw His mighty works and they repented not. And that is why He is rebuking them. And basically the greatest sin is the sin of indifference to Christ. The indifference to Christ is the worst of sins. Here he says, he begins to rebuke the, the, the cities of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. And, and Jesus strongly rebukes them. Um, why? Well, he says, uh, he says because. What, what's the reason for, for this rebuke? Because they saw his mighty works. Mighty works here translates the word dunamis, which means works of power. The power of God was put on display. Jesus displayed it. His miracles, His teaching, all of that. And the light of those mighty works, in the light of those mighty works, the people of these cities refused to repent. They didn't oppose Jesus openly. They did not criticize Jesus openly in these cities. They, they attended His sermons. They uh, allowed Him to walk openly in their midst. They did not persecute Him. But they did not respond to what they saw and what they heard there. In this region, in, in Galilee, the people saw Christ raise the daughter of Jairus from the dead. They saw Jesus... Christ heal the nobleman's son. They saw Jesus Christ 
cast demons out of people. He healed Peter, Peter's mother-in-law who had a deadly fever. There was a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years who just touched the hem of his garment and that disease was gone. He gave sight to two blind men. He made a paralyzed man who they lowered through the roof. He made him stand up and walk and carry his bed on out of there to the astonishment of the whole crowd. Yet they were never moved. They were never moved to repentance. In other words, these people simply ignored what they were seeing. They ignored Christ. They were entertained by Him. They might have even liked Him. But they refused to allow His message to move them. In Capernaum, in Chorazin, in Bethsaida, the surrounding territories, Jesus is, is uh, pronouncing a rebuke on these cities and the surrounding territory because they re are representative of the whole. But in these areas, when Christ called for repentance, they just went on with their lives as if nothing different had happened. In other words, it was life as usual. It was business as usual in Galilee when Jesus was preaching and when He was teaching and He, he was calling for repentance. Oh, they came when He fed 5,000 and broke bread for them. But they disappeared when the bread was gone and, and, and uh, the, the rubber meets the road. It was business as usual in those cities. That means it was indifference. Business as usual or or indifference to Christ could take several forms there. Families were still together for the most part. The community as a whole was a moral community. It was an upstanding place. You might be able to go play with your kids in the park and not have to worry about it getting mugged or some crazy thing like that. People faithfully attended the synagogue services. Men worked hard and supported their families. Even on the outside, everything on the outside looked great. It was business as usual. But Christ called for them to repent because he had to call on the publican to stop cheating on, on collecting taxes. He called on Pharisees and scribes to repent of their self-righteousness and their trust in their own works and their tradition and, and humble themselves in God's hand. He called on people to stop taking worth, worthless oaths and to stop hating their enemies and to, uh, to better treat the poor. Yet few, if anybody, actually repented. Thousands thronged Jesus when He would teach. When He went to the cross, He was alone. I want you to see from Scripture this morning that the worst of sins, worse than anything you can imagine, is the sin of indifference to Christ. Jesus said so. And He lays out His case. He proves it here as if a, a lawyer walked into a courtroom and, and laid out exhibit A, exhibit B, and proved His case. As if He's presenting an open and shut uh, case here. So how can we understand this? Because when I read this, I thought, that, that just can't be. I can think of a lot of worse things. Is this really true that that indifference to Christ is the worst of all sins. I can think of some people that have done worse, perhaps you would say. How do we understand the gravity of this? Well, let's review the case that Christ lays out. All right? If you want to understand this, we need to review the case that Christ makes in God's courtroom. And so, first of all, to understand this, that indifference to Christ is the worst of sins. First thing you need to do is review the indictment. Review the indictment. The, the indifferent here are indicted by Christ and they deserve judgment. That's what he is saying. Indifference deserves judgment. That's the indictment. Look at verse 20. Uh, or verse, verse 20 again. We'll read a little bit into verse 21. He began to upbraid the cities wherein most of His mighty works were done because they repented not. And here's what He says, Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! Now, I've never sat and watched a judicial proceeding in a courtroom live. I've never done that. But I, I have seen it on television. <laughs> Alright, that might not go over so well. But uh, as I understand it from watching it on the news or, or on a TV show or something like that, the prosecuting attorney presents his case 
and it is decided there whether or not the case has enough merit to go to trial. So the prosecuting attorney comes in and basically accuses the defendant. And then if there's enough uh, evidence there, if the case is merited trial, um, the defendant is formally accused by the court, and that is called being indicted. And so Christ makes his case for the indictment. And here's the indictment Christ presents against indifference. And by indifference, I don't mean it, that you don't care who won the ball game or you're indifferent about the speed limit or something like that. Uh, I am talking about indifference to God in his word, indifference to Jesus Christ. To be indifferent to Christ, you actually have to hear from him. You have to actually have to know his name and you have to, and you have to be uh, taught the word of God. That is you have to have that opportunity and then not care about it. All right? That's what I'm talking about. And that's why the people in Galilee had the great opportunity to commit this sin. Here's the indictment. These cities, Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, saw most of Jesus' mighty works, as we said. They were given the greatest light that any people in history have ever been given. They, they spoke to, they interacted with, and lived by God Himself in the flesh. They saw the proof of His power in His mighty works. They were given the greatest revelation from God that has ever been. And yet, they were unmoved and did not repent. You read in the Old Testament, any time a prophet comes face to face with God or sees a vision of God, what does he do? Falls on his face. Isaiah the prophet, the great holy man of God, he, he saw a vision of God in the temple and first thing he does is he falls on his face and says, I'm, a, I'm unclean. Uh, and that's the reaction of repentance. But it was business as usual in Galilee. They didn't, op they didn't oppress Christ, didn't oppose Him. They were just indifferent because they did not care. So Jesus pronounced an indictment. In verse 21, He says, Woe. Now, woe doesn't mean slow down your horse, all right? Uh, woe is an interjection, and it's a denunciation of severity. And by saying woe, Jesus is warning these cities that they're in serious trouble, and they're deserving of that trouble. They deserve the judgment, and that's the indictment. Jesus says they're guilty, and they deserve judgment. They deserve to go to trial. Uh, one commentator puts it this way. He says, from the human perspective, their indifference, indifference appears foolish, but it does not appear to be terribly sinful. But indifference is a heinous form of unbelief. It, is, it so completely disregards God that He is not even an issue worth arguing about. He is not taken seriously enough even to criticize. Indifference is the worst of sins, and it deser deserves severe judgment, and that is the indictment. Jesus says, woe unto you who have committed this sin. Is it really true? I mean, is this, is this, is this for real, that indifference to Christ is not caring? It is worse than all of these sins that perhaps you can conjure up in your mind that you want to put on the list above that? How can it be true? Well, did the indictment stick? Jesus has put out the indictment. Did the court throw it out? Was it a mistrial or does the indictment stick? Well, let's take the next step here. To understand that, that uh, indifference to Christ is the worst of sins, we've reviewed the indictment. Now, you have to review the verdict. It's a guilty verdict. You have to review the verdict. Indifference is guilty. It's worst of the worst. Look at verse 21 here. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, and woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Verse 23, and Thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. In a courtroom, when the defendant is formally indicted, the trial begins. The trial in the trial, the prosecuting attorney, attorney lays out evidence, right? Exhibit A, Exhibit B, I'm sure, I guess that's how it works. And at the end of the trial, the court pronounces a verdict, whether it's a trial by judge or trial by jury, there is a, a, a verdict that is proclaimed, guilty or not guilty. 
Jesus Christ here lays out the evidence to prove that indifference to Christ is in fact the worst of all sins. And he, he starts with exhibit A, and that is Tyre and Sidon. Now, Tyre and Sidon might not mean much to you, uh, but Tyre and Sidon, in the mind of Galilean Jews, had a very special meaning, a very specific meaning. Uh, they epitomized, these two cities epitomized Gentile corruption and worthlessness. The people in these cities were descendants of the ancient Phoenicians who were renowned for their, for their sea trade and exploration. They were colonizers of the Mediterranean. Both cities were typical seaports, noted for their immorality and godliness, or godlessness, even by pagan standards they were godless, deeply involved in licentious ball worship. In Ezekiel chapter 28, the prophet of God found that the king of Tyre was so proud and so evil that he used the king of Tyre as an example to talk about Satan himself. The city's violence and profanity and pride and injustice and greed and immorality were so excessive that the Lord destroyed it and raised it to the ground. Tyre and Sidon were the most profane and violent and immoral people imaginable to the Galilean Jewish mind. Yet, Jesus says, if they saw the light that you saw, Chorazin and Bethsaida, those people would have repented. Yet you have not been moved. You have not repented. In other words, the indifference of Chorazin and Bethsaida was a greater sin than the sins of these, the worst cities that they could imagine. Worse than Tyre and Sidon. That's exhibit A in Jesus' case against Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum. But he enters exhibit B. Verse 23, we see exhibit B is Sodom. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Even the pagan secular world, even there the name Sodom means, and it is synonymous with the most deviant forms of homosexuality, immorality, and bestiality. They're categorized together in the Old Testament. The, the men of Sodom were so corrupt, so enslaved to their perversion, that when two angels came to visit Lot in Sodom, the men of that city got together and attempted to gang rape those angels. And even after that, the angels struck them with blindness, and, and, and so perverse were these men that after being struck blind, they groped for the door of Lot's house so that they could satisfy their, their violent sexual lust. Jesus says here that if Sodom had seen the Son of God perform these miracles, they would have remained until this day. In other words, that city would have repented if they saw what you saw, Capernaum. He says here of Capernaum that it was exalted unto heaven. Think about this. Heaven is characterized by the very manifest presence of God. It is His throne room. And so heaven is heaven because God is there. But like heaven, Capernaum became the home of the manifested Son of God. God Himself lived there. So, just, so, so Capernaum was like heaven in that God was living there. He says you'll be brought down to hell. He's, and although all, everybody who rejects Jesus Christ will literally go to hell, Jesus is speaking figuratively, figuratively here to say that Capernaum is going to be destroyed in judgment. Hell is absolute destruction for anybody that goes there. And he says, Capernaum, you have been like heaven and you're going to be like hell. You're going to be destroyed. Why will this city be so judged? Because they saw such a great light that the most wicked city that you can imagine would have repented if they saw that. And yet they did not repent. Indifference to Christ is proven to be the worst of the worst. Exhibit A and Exhibit B are, are uh, put on the stand. In another place, Jesus gives us an Exhibit C, so to, so to speak. 
In Luke chapter 11, in verse 29 through 32, uh, we find Jesus saying this, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Joseph the pro jo Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was, in the, was, was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. See, this, this is a similar indictment of the same people. And Jesus uh, told about ancient pagan people who actually did repent with less light. That's what he's saying. He's saying, first of all, Jesus lays out the evidence. Here are people who didn't repent. Tyre, Sidon, Sodom. And he saw their destruction. And, and they would have repented if they saw this light. And then he lays out another piece of evidence, kind of the flip side of the same coin. And he says, here's the queen of, of the south, the queen of Sheba. And, and she had less light, far less light. Solomon, she came and she heard the wisdom of Solomon and she repented. And here's the men of Nineveh and they were wicked and evil men. And Jonah, just one guy shows up and goes on a preaching tour through this city and the whole city repents. A lot less light. It said they're going to rise up in the day of judgment and they're going to condemn you because they saw far less light than you saw God Himself and you were not moved. So what is the verdict? It's guilty. I mean, the, the gavel falls and, and, and indifference to Christ is found worse of the worst. But surely that can't be true, right? I mean, indifference, if you walk around indifference to Christ, you, you don't hurt anybody, you don't steal anything, you're not, you're not breaking into someone's house, you're not murdering anybody. Certainly that's not worse than that. Is indifference to Christ really the worst of all sins? Well, to understand this, you have to review one more part of the trial, and that's this review the sentence. And here God gives, Jesus gives the maximum sentence to indifference. It's severely punished. He lays down the law and it is the max sentence. There's no leniency given here. Look at verse 22. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. Verse 24. I say unto you, Capernaum, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. So Jesus makes plain two truths here. Truth number one is this, that there will be de degrees of punishment in hell. I once heard a preacher when I was, a, I was at a youth meeting and a preacher said this, said if you're not going to believe in Christ, you might as well go out and live however you want to because you're going to hell anyway. That was one of the worst pieces of advice I've ever heard. Because God teaches right here, Jesus says, some people are going to have a, a, a greater damnation. He said to the scribes and Pharisees in another place, you'll go to, to have, you'll, you'll, transgress, you'll transverse heaven and earth to make one proselyte, you'll make him twofold more a child of hell than yourselves, and you'll receive the greater damnation. And so there are degrees of punishment in hell. That's truth number one. Truth number two is that the greatest degree of punishment is reserved for those who receive the greatest divine revelation and refuse to repent. Those who were given the most light are given the most accountability. Those who were given the gospel, those who were given a, a, a view of the Son of God and yet were indifferent will receive the greatest penalty. There is a judgment day, and the judgment day in view that, that Christ is speaking of is the great white throne judgment. And it's spoken of in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. It speaks of the, the earth and the sea giving up their dead. At, at the last day, at the last judgment, the great white throne, the, uh, the bodies of all who have died who were in unbelief, everyone who died in their sins rejecting Christ will be raised from the dead and their spirits will be reunited with their physical bodies and they will stand before God to be judged. 
The Bible says on Judgment Day that the lake of fire here will burn hotter for those who saw the greatest light of revelation from God than those who didn't see much light at all. Reunited with the physical body and cast into the lake of fire. For those who refuse to repent at the preaching of Christ, for the indifferent, there will be no mercy, no leniency, maximum penalty in hell. Jesus said, do you remember reading about God raining fire, Genesis 19, on Sodom and Gomorrah and the overthrow and the smoke of the land could be seen? God wiped Sodom and Gomorrah right off the map. Yet Capernaum, he says, you'll be worse off on Judgment Day. And so there's the sentence. The verdict is guilty and the sentence is maximum. You know what God is doing here, what Jesus is doing? He is treating indifference to Christ as if it is the worst possible thing. The worst possible sin. Indifference to Christ is the worst of sins. As we looked at the indictment, we found out that the indifferent deserved judgment. We looked at the verdict and it was guilty. The indifferent, indifference is worse than the worst. We looked at the, the sentence and it was given the maximum penalty. God saves the most severe punishment for the most severe crimes. They say, they say the punishment should fit the crime, right? Now I'm going to ask you to pronounce a verdict upon yourselves this morning. Are you sitting there a person who has seen the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ preached over and over again and yet refuse to repent and never come to Christ and, and come to Christ to trust in Him and Him alone for your salvation? Because this isn't the end of the story. This is just the beginning. Jesus would go to a cross. He would, he would shed His blood. He did shed His blood to pay for your sin and mine so that you don't have to pay that penalty in hell. He died, was buried, was ro rose again from the dead and lives today and will save you if you call out to Him in repentance. Are you one that has heard that over and over and over again and you just refuse to repent? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 29 says this, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for, of judgment and fiery indig indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witness. Listen to this. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be that thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. The writer of Hebrews is saying, is saying, if you've sat under the preaching of God's Word, and you've heard the Gospel, and you've known the truth, and you yet refuse to respond in repentance and calling out to Christ for salvation, he says, your punishment will be worse than someone who never heard the, the, the grace of God. Are you sitting here as a believer who, when you hear the Bible preached or you read the, the, the Scriptures or the Holy Spirit pricks your heart about a sin that's ongoing in your life and you, you say, no, God, I refuse to repent. I'm going to do my thing. And you know what? God just understands. I mean, God's my buddy up in the sky and, and He understands. I'm, just, I, I'm weak. I'm a, I'm a per You know, God's okay with this. It's, that's how most American Christians think. You now I can just do what I can say what I want, do what I want, live how I want. And guess what? You know what? Jesus died for me. It's cool. I can do what I want to. Really? Are you sitting there as a Christian who hears God's word and it contradicts you? And you just think, well, I'm comfortable. And you don't care? Now, this is talking about lost people. I mean, the main application of this passage is talking about lost people, but I tell you what, that scares me. That scares me. Let me tell you what repentance is. By the way, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 says this, For the believer, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and, listen to this word, scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. You know what a scourging is? That's not a paddle. That's a whip, all right? It draws blood. 
That scares me. Let me tell you what repentance is. Repentance is when you pronounce the verdict. I've asked you to pronounce a verdict, all right? Repentance is when you pronounce the verdict and you say guilty. That's repentance, all right? That's when God shows you something from his word or from the preaching or through the Holy Spirit and you say, God, I agree with that. I confess my sins. And the Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You pronounce the verdict. In a moment, they're going to come and bring an invitation him. And you pronounce the verdict as guilty and you beg God for mercy and for grace to live according to His will because we are human and we do fall short of God's glory and we need that grace and that mercy. But guess what? We need to come to Him confessing our sins in repentance. You can have God's mercy if you repent of your sins, Christian. You know what the evidence is that you're saved? Some people may ask, sometimes I don't feel saved. You know what the evidence is that you're saved? It's that you repented and came to Christ, but it didn't stop right there. You could keep repenting. When God brings sin to your life and into your mind, and, and, and you say, oh, I, I know what God has showed me in his word. And, and maybe even you struggle with that for a while, but it is a lifelong repentance. You call on the name of the Lord, but you keep calling on the name of the Lord. You repented, but you keep repenting. That is the Christian life. That is how you are molded and shaped into the image of Jesus Christ. You can have God's mercy and repentance, or you can have business as usual. I mean, you can just go about your life and different to Christ, and maybe you can be comfortable till you die, but you will die. Or Christ will come, so you can't do it forever. Do you want to be close to Christ? Do you want to have his blessings? Do you want to have his peace? Do you want to live in his grace? Then it, when it comes to the sin that God points out in your life, and I don't know, you listen, I don't, I don't walk around town checking up on everybody. I, I just can't live like that. There are, I've known some pastors, they go around checking up on all their church members. Maybe I should, I don't know. I really don't want to know that much. God knows. If you want to live in His, if you want to, if you want to live in His peace and die blessed, it can't be business as usual. It can't be indifference because that is the worst that you can do.